started indeed. All right. Hello, everyone. This is very exciting. Welcome to one and all. I Let's see. I see friends. I see students, teachers, truth seekers, time travelers, all of you. I call this evening to order. Welcome to Skeptical Inquirer Presents. This is a series of live online presentations from experts who are devoted to advancing science over pseudoscience, media literacy over conspiracy theories, and critical thinking over magical thinking. My name is Leanne Lord, and I am delighted to be your host. I am a stand-up comedian, author, CFI fellow, and fellow earth dweller. In addition to our show today, uh, it is Helium Discovery Day, which is a hell of a time to discover that there's a worldwide helium shortage. Ergo, no helium party balloons or coolant for MRI machines. Who knew? It is also Pinot Noir Day, which begs the question, when is it not? <laughs> Now that we're all settled in, uh, I have a couple of quick reminders. Uh, the Center for Inquiry's podcast, Point of Inquiry, is available wherever you get your podcasts. Uh, if you'd like to upgrade your beach reading or spruce up your coffee table, might I suggest a subscription to Skeptical Inquirer magazine, which is available, coincidentally, at skepticalinquirer.org. And now... Uh, tonight's presentation is the elephant in the room, why facts don't change minds and what to do about it. I love, love, love this topic. It reminds me of a conversation about cognitive dissonance that I had with one of our early guests on Skeptical Inquirer Presents, uh, the phenomenal Carol Tavares, co-author of Mistakes Were Made But Not By Me. Uh, why we justify foolish beliefs, bad decisions, and hurtful acts. It is sometimes baffling to learn that uh, people don't give a flying fig about your facts. And if we're honest, we don't care about theirs either. Now, while that makes for some great bar fights, it sucks at building community, developing healthy relationships, or, or even having a rational public discourse. And so... Tamar Haspel is with us tonight to talk about, well, the elephant in the room, or as the French say, l'elephant dans la pièce. Uh, she writes the James Beard award-winning Washington Post column, Unearthed, which looks at how our diet affects our planet. Uh, she's also written for Discover, Vox, Slate, Fortune, Eater, and Edible Cape Cod. She co-hosts the Climavores podcast, and her book, To Boldly Grow, is about the good things that happen when you roll up your sleeves, go outside, and get dirty in the service of dinner. Reviewers call it hilarious and delightful. Now, I'll be honest, uh, she lost me at Go Outside because I'm not an outdoorsy person. I mean, you hear birds chirping and I hear the hunting cries of a velociraptor. But I'm always up for a good funny read. And so I have her book to boldly grow on hold right now at the New York Public Library. Uh, but she's here tonight to talk about how we humans make decisions and why facts seem so disturbingly unpersuasive. So please welcome to the screen, Tamar Haspel. Tamar, I turn it over to you, my dear. Leanne, thank you very <laughs> much. I had no welcome. idea had a helium problem. Oh, I didn't either. I didn't either. You go to buy a balloon for somebody and yeah, it's like toilet paper in 2020. It's not there. <laughs> the things you learn. Ah, well, we well, do try. Your turn. Thank you for the introduction. And, and I was delighted to get this invitation because I actually grew up reading the Skeptical Inquirer. My parents were, were subscribers. And when we talk about facts and evidence-based decision-making, you know, I don't think that there's a single audience that I would rather be talking to than this one. And so thank you for having me. And uh, and I'm looking forward to, well, unfortunately, I have to talk to a screen for a while. But after that's done, I'm really looking forward to, to some Q&A. So, but before I kick this off, I have a question for you. And right now it looks like there's 400 of you out there. So when was the last time you changed your mind and not, you know, paper or plastic, treadmill or elliptical, an issue of substance, something that you took a position on, something that you argued with your family 
about over the dinner table. And then you found yourself believing something different in the last year, in the last two years. And be specific, because we all like to think of ourselves as the kind of flexible reasoners who do change our minds in the face of changing evidence. But if you go back and think of specific things you changed your mind about, sometimes it's hard to find them in the recent past. And, you know, I've given this talk to rooms of hundreds, occasionally thousands of people. And I'll ask people to raise their hands and tell me a story of when you changed your mind in the last year. And in a room of hundreds or even thousands, I'll get a handful of hands. Um, I'll hear a handful of stories. People do change their minds. But I think it's fair to say that there is not an epidemic of mind changing going on. And so when we interrogate ourselves, we find that uh, it's hard to find those instances of changing minds, yet we go out in the world expecting to change other people's minds. And this is about why that strategy doesn't usually work very well and what we might do to have better conversations, particularly with people we disagree with, particularly on charged issues. Okay, so now I have to do the share screen thing. So let's get that going. And, oh wait, I, I'm i sorry. I, first I have to share the screen. Then I have to do the thing. We'll get it. Okay, and now we will present. And we are good to go. So, This is how we think we make decisions. We read up, maybe we go on PubMed, we read the news, um, and we decide what we think is true and we come to a fact-based conclusion. But this is how we really do it. And I'm borrowing this metaphor from, from John Haidt. And he wrote a book called The Righteous Mind. I think it came out in 2012. And I remember the day that my father, the skeptical inquirer subscriber, came over to my house with a copy of the book because he had read it and it had made a profound impact on him. And he thought I would be interested. And I was. And this is John Haidt's metaphor, the elephant and the rider. The elephant is the sum total of our intuition, our tribal affiliations, our cultural affiliations, basically our gut, our values. And the rider is the intellectual part, the part that parses evidence. And when a charged issue comes down the pike, our elephant knows exactly what we think about it. And the elephant goes in a particular direction. And we would think it would be the rider's job to say, whoa, that's not what the evidence supports, but that's not how it works. Instead, it's the rider's job to justify the direction that the elephant has gone in. And, you know, Jonathan Haidt wrote about it in The Righteous Mind. And some of you may have read Daniel Kahneman's book, Thinking Fast and Slow. And he made basically the same case where the system one is the elephant and system two is the rider. But they're basically saying the same thing about the nature of human cognition. And, you know, one of the things that's interesting about this is that, you know, there's tons of disagreement on all the charged issues we're going to mention today, but there's not a lot of disagreement on the fact that this is how human minds work. And, you know, these guys are actually late to the party because we all know that David Hume said it back in the 1700s, that reason is slave to the passions. This is something that people have observed about humans ever since there were humans observing humans. And the main way that we're able to do this is confirmation bias. And it absolutely rules the human psyche. And there are two ways that it does that. Well, there are more than two, but I'm going to talk about two. And one is really straightforward and one is a little more diabolical. So the straightforward one is that we actually seek out evidence that supports our worldview. You know, which news channels are you looking at? Um, which publications are you reading? Which columnists who write about food in the Washington Post are, are you paying attention to? 
Um, who are your actual friends? Who are your virtual friends? How, you know, what do you see that comes up in your Facebook feed or your Twitter feed? And when you get opinions that disagree with yours, is it mostly reconnaissance because you're trying to see how other people are thinking? Or is this something that really makes you question your own worldview? So that's a really straightforward way that confirmation bias works. We surround ourselves with things that support our worldview. But there's, there's a more sort of diabolical way that this happens. And that is that we have all of these cognitive tricks um, to, to reject information that challenges our worldview. And, you know, if you think about it, it makes all kinds of sense, because if if this has to do with our our cultural affiliations or, or our tribal affiliations, when stuff comes in to challenge it, of course, you circle the wagons. And in some cases, having your view challenged can actually entrench that view rather than have you question that view. But one of the ways we see this playing out and we see it playing out in social media all the time is that if someone presents a fact to you um, and it doesn't jibe with your view of the world, one of the easiest ways to dismiss it is to dismiss the person who's laid it in front of you. And Dan Kahan at Yale has done a lot of interesting research about all of this. And he did this one study that really stuck with me where he had, you know, three experts and you know, they're experts, they're like, they're old white guys in suits. And they all have fake resumes that are essentially the same. And he brings subjects in and the subjects read the opinions of those experts on these charged issues and then rate the credibility of the expert. And I'm sure it will surprise no one to learn that when the expert agrees with them, they're viewed as credible. And when they don't, they're viewed as non-credible. So we are much more tied to the thing that we believe than we are to the experts who may be weighing in on these things. And the net of this is, is that facts are not persuasive because we have these ways to dismiss them and fall back on what our elephant thought in the first place. Let's look at some examples, but I'm sure you can pull some off of your social media feed almost any day of the week, but let's look at climate change. And, you know, back in 2003, when climate change was a less charged issue, there was actually a substantial bit of agreement between Republicans, independents, and Democrats. But as time went on, excuse me, as time went on, and as that issue became more charged, those points of view diverged. And, and Republicans now are less likely to believe that global warming is caused by human activity and Democrats are more likely to believe it. So the polarization has just really created this huge schism. But, you know, let's look at mask wearing, a recent example. Again, it was charged almost from the moment that it started. And Democrats and Republicans have remained polarized on this issue. And you could find a similar uh, chart, no doubt, of, uh, of vaccines. But there are tons of other issues, too. Let's look at nuclear energy. This is something that Republicans favor and Democrats don't. And they never have, even though, OK, if we care about climate change and here's this kind of energy that is carbon free, you would expect something different. But it has just it has taken root as a charged issue, as has renewable energy. And here you see the flip side of that, where Democrats believe 92 percent that we should uh, produce electricity using 100 percent renewable sources. And Republicans are at 27 percent. These are huge schisms. OK, so so let's dig down into who believes these things and is anybody better at at sort of parsing this evidence than other people and and science unfortunately doesn't protect you and i know i talk to scientists all the time and of course a lot of them are understand this perfectly and 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 run their careers trying to to question their own ideas and i had two people, both intelligent, both in good faith, 
um, both PhD scientists tell me almost verbatim, I'm not pro-GMO or anti-GMO. I follow the science and go where it leads me. And one of them may be listening, Kevin Falta, if you're out there. Um, one of them is Kevin Falta. He's a professor at the University of Florida. And if he is unwilling to say that he is pro-GMO, I'm not going to say that about him. But I think it's fair to say that he sees that the upsides of GMOs vastly outweigh the downsides. The other is Doug Gurian Sherman at the Center for Food Safety. And he believes that the downsides outweigh the upsides. And I'm not going to weigh in on you know, who's correct. The point here is that intelligent, well-educated scientists um, can come to opposite conclusions about a set of facts. So you know, what hope is there for the rest of us? And again, uh, Dan Kahan has done some interesting work on this. And for me, this is like the scariest chart, you know, in the public discourse sphere. sphere. So the x-axis there is science intelligence. It's And it was assessed by taking a little test about science and uh, to see how much you know about science. And then the y-axis is whether people believe that there's evidence, again, that global warming is due to human activity. And the people who know the least about science are actually in the same place, whether they're Republican or they're Democrats. But the more they know about science, the more polarized their view becomes. And why is this? Well, part of it probably has to do with confidence. And if you have a PhD and you're a scientist, you may have a great deal of confidence in your ability to parse this information. But in reality, you're making decisions exactly the way all humans make decisions, which is with your elephant. And now I wanna make a comparison here. Here's another one. Um, it's about human beings develop, developing from an earlier species of animal. And again, here is uh, ordinary science intelligence on the x-axis. But in this case, we're not looking at Democrats and Republicans. We're looking at another kind of value schism, which is religion. And uh, for people who are above average re in religiosity, so the people who are more religious, the more they know about science, the less likely they are to believe that humans descended from other animals. And of course, it's the reverse. And, you know, when it's religion, we tend to give it a pass for a very good reason, because religion provides community. It provides values. Um, it's something that's very good and important in a lot of people's lives. And I think most people don't want to diss that. I, I certainly don't. But let's look at the comparison. Let me go back for a second. Look at how those two graphs compare, whether it's climate change or humans evolving from animals. It's basically the same phenomenon and science doesn't protect you. The other thing that doesn't protect you is education. And of course, this is a function, uh, partly a function of science. And you know, I never put quotes up for people to read themselves in a presentation with this one exception, because I think it's really important. I'm gonna give you two seconds to read it. The better educated you are, the better you are at confirmation bias. And you know, this is a scary thing. And, and a lot of the reason that it's scary is because we all feel like the decisions we're making aren't driven by confirmation bias. They're driven by the, the fact-based kind of evidence-based decisions that we really want to make. Um, but let's see if we can catch it in action. So uh, uh, confirmation bias in action. So I write about food and there are things that I have written about that are supported by a, you know, the, the overwhelming preponderance of the evidence that people really hate. And I'm going to give you four of them. And if you agree with me on all four, you're going to think I'm a damn genius because you're going to rate my credibility as, as high because you agree with me. 
But if I get to one that you don't agree with, you're going to start questioning whether you should be listening to me at all. Um, and and it's hard when you find something that that contradicts your view um, to start questioning your own view rather than the, the credibility of the evidence. So let's go. Number one, and this is the one that pisses people off more than just about anything else. And of course, you know, I write for people, a lot of whom are interested in nutrition. Diet soda is just fine. It is not bad for you. It does not disturb your gut microbiome. It does not make you gain weight. It does not increase your taste for sweet things. Diet soda is totally fine. I don't know if you're, I, I, I can't see you. So I don't know who's nodding and who's throwing rotten fruit. So two, food deserts don't cause obesity. And again, this was this was a theory that that got a lot of traction back in oh, around 2008. And they started really studying it with rigor. And there are a number of studies that go into food deserts and put in a full service supermarket. And then they try and see what happens to people's diets. And the answer is nothing. So food deserts don't cause obesity. And that doesn't mean that food deserts are good. I want everyone to have access to, to a supermarket, but, but food deserts do not cause obesity. Okay. Third one, and now that we're talking about climate, local foods are not better for the environment. And this is something people who shop at farmer's markets are very tied to, but it, the evidence just does not bear it out. Now, there are lots of other reasons to buy local food. I'm not opposed to local food. They support local economies. I think Local farms are great because it's a place where a, a, a kid can meet a pig. Um, a, farmers markets are community touchstones. Um, this, they're good for so many reasons, local food, but they are not better for the environment. And the other one, and after diet soda, this is the one that earns me the most hate mail. Backyard eggs and supermarket eggs taste the same. And uh, there, there's actually not a lot of evidence here because there haven't been that many people who have done blind taste tests, but I'm one of them. And uh, Kenji lopez Alt, and if any of you are in the food world, maybe you recognize his name, he's done another one. And the poultry scientists have done it too. And they all agree that backyard eggs and supermarket eggs taste the same. And I do this just as an exercise in maybe trying to challenge some of the things that people believe and just seeing how you feel about it when that happens, because it, it, it's almost hard to wrap your mind around the fact that we don't make evidence-based decisions. Why would we be bad at this? Well, there's a really good reason. Let's let's look at human evolution. You know, for four million years ago, where where the proto-humans first started developing, we have had a long time to develop our decision-making apparatus, and science came along basically last Tuesday, evolutionary time, and so it's not surprising that our decision-making apparatus has evolved for the, the personal, the experiential, the, um, the tribal, the cultural. Um, and we can't incorporate spreadsheets all that easily because there weren't spreadsheets for all of the time that, that we were evolving. And so we have this decision-making apparatus that's coming you know, smack in, in collision with this modern world that puts data in front of us. And it's just, it's a terrible, terrible mismatch. So, all right, what do we do about this? Um, I will tell you that when I read Jonathan Haidt's book, um, it scared the bejesus out of me because I found it very persuasive. And the bottom line is that humans suck at evidence-based decision-making. And, you know, I'm a science journalist. It's my job to try and figure out what's true. How can I do that job if humans suck at evidence-based decision-making? And so it became my top journalistic priority 
to try and find ways to check my own bias, to make sure that I'm not drinking my own Kool-Aid, that I'm not engaging in bubonic confirmation bias. Um, and in fact, that I'm actively going out in the world looking for opportunities to change my mind. And I will tell you that it is not easy. But over the years, I have developed some strategies to do this. And, um, you know, lots of them are not evidence based. This is just my attempt to negotiate the world in a way that maximizes the chance that I won't be completely swayed by my priors when I go into a scientific issue. So here is my cranky personal list of ways to check your own bias. Number one, you gotta believe. And in, in some ways, this is one of the hardest ones because it doesn't feel like this is what we do. And I know I've said that about three or four times already, but I'm gonna say it again. It feels like we are assessing facts. When we go to PubMed and we find the, the studies, it feels like we are conducting an, a disinterested survey of the literature, but we're not. And if you don't have to believe me, read Height's book, um, read Daniel Kahneman's book, um, because if you're not persuaded of this, then you know I don't think anything else is gonna work. So that's number one, you gotta believe. Number two, assume good faith in people who disagree with you. And I know this is a very hard thing to do in our political climate because there is a lot of bad faith. There is a lot of lying, cheating, and stealing. Um, and it's, it's, you know, it's, it's very disheartening. Um, but even if you suspect that that's what's going on, I have found that it serves me in good faith um, uh, to assume good faith. And that's a picture of Vandana Shiva. And Vandana Shiva is uh, an activist. She's Indian. Um, she's an activist for organic food. She is uh, anti-GMO. And she has uh, repeated a lot of things that are just out and out false about genetically modified crops, including that they have increased farmer suicides in, in India. And I've had this conversation with other people in food who insist that she is lying, but I don't believe that she is lying. I believe that she talks to people every day who reinforce this for her. And at the end of the day, it's a lot easier, human cognition being what it is, to persuade yourself that something is true than it is to go out and lie about it every day. So assume that the people who are taking this position are taking it in good faith and really believe it. Try and find common ground, and I know it's difficult. And this is a picture of me, and that's a deer that, that I shot. I do hunt. Um, and I also go and talk to farmers. Uh, I um, it's part of my job. I go to Iowa and I stand out in a cornfield and farmers for the most part are right leaning, older, white, rural, Christian. And here I am, I'm a columnist for the Washington post. I'm so coastal. My socks are damp and let's face it. Everything about me screams New York Jew. And I stand in that cornfield with that farmer who has every reason to be skeptical of how I am going to present the things that he says. And I am worried that we can't have a constructive conversation because we, we can't bridge this, this cultural gap. And, but you know, in farm country, most farmers hunt or they lease out their land to other people who hunt. Um, and so we talk, about hunting and I have my picture of my deer and he has his picture of his. And if you can talk about hunting, you can talk about guns. And if you can talk about guns, you can talk about anything. And you know, it sounds like a party trick, but it isn't. It's like this genuine effort 
to find something that we have in common, because that way, maybe we can build just enough trust to have a conversation about the things that we don't have in common. Number four, find the smartest person who disagrees with you and listen. And I do this all the time. And, you know, I've been writing about food for 20 odd years. And when a subject comes down the pike, it's unlikely that it's new to me. Um, it's likely that I've thought about it. It's likely that I have opinions about it. And before I write about it, I find the smartest people I can. And I ask them why they disagree. And I will tell you that sometimes the smartest people who disagree with you are really don't care for that role all that much. <laughs> and I can see why. But uh, but so many people have been generous with their time because it's it's so easy to dismiss a jerk, but it's hard to dismiss somebody you respect and admire who disagrees with you. And, you know, tied to that is identifying the other side's strongest arguments not their weakest arguments. And that's a picture of my father. And that is what he looked like, a little fuzzy with a glass of wine. And uh, too bad there's no skeptical inquirer in the background there. And my father, when we were when we were a kid, actually his whole life, would take any side of any argument just for the sheer exercise of hashing it out. That's how he learned. And that's it ended up being how I learned too. And, and I guess I internalized at a young age that most arguments, most issues have at least two reasonable sides. And I will tell you that you do not know intellectual humiliation until you have lost an argument to somebody who is taking a position that he doesn't even believe. But now when I'm writing about something, um, and it's, I'm taking a position, I try to also include the very strongest arguments against the position that I'm taking. And I thank my father every single time. He, he died a few years ago and I miss him. And, and let's fess up here. Look, the, the, the willingness to take any side of any argument is not an endearing human characteristic. But my father was pretty awesome and I learned a lot from him. Vet your sources and manage your media. You know, who are you listening to? Who's in your feed? Um, what news channels are you watching? Um, and, you know, I do a lot of speaking out in the real world, not just through a screen. And I try and make sure that I spend time in rooms where people do believe different things. And you can do that virtually too. Make sure that you have the smartest people who disagree with you coming through your Twitter feed or your Facebook feed. Um, and I think that that can help a lot. And I think it's even a venue where you can ask questions, excuse me. Um, and if you have a real question about a position that you don't agree with, um, I think it can sometimes really lead to an actual good conversation on Twitter or Facebook. I know as rare as that sounds. And of course, you should be following me on Twitter at Tamar Haspel. Drop the word anti-science from your vocabulary. Everybody since the beginning of time has believed that the science supports their point of view. And I was in uh, uh, Oregon. And I was driving out to the coast and I had NPR on the radio and I had just turned it on and I got into this. There was a conversation going on with a guy who was starting a museum. And he said, you know, I want people to decide this issue on the facts. I want them to decide for themselves. I'm like, oh, what's this a museum of? And it turned out it was a museum of New Earth creationism. And so people who believe things that are really at odds with all the science as we know it and you know forget nuclear energy forget gmos i mean i mean human evolution is pretty fundamental yet people who don't believe it um believe that the science supports their point of view and you know the british journalist will store wrote a fascinating book I, its british title was the unpersuadables and i think it's called something else in the united states but where he went to talk to people who had these 
outlandish beliefs about New Earth creationism, Holocaust denial, things like that. And he had this idea that, well, I'll just show them these facts and they'll change their minds. But of course they don't because the, the, lots of people have showed them the facts and they have elaborate defenses for why those facts are the wrong facts. And it is a fascinating book that I recommend highly. Will Store, The Unpersuadables. Police your side. And, you know, I don't think we even like to admit that we have sides, but we do. And, you know, I know in my Twitter feed, there are lots of people who agree with me. There are lots of people who disagree with me. And if people who agree with me overstep, take the argument too far, or even, you know, are, are engaged in some, an ad hominem attack, I, and I know, again, this is not an endearing human characteristic, but hell, I'm my father's daughter. And I, I try to push back on that for two reasons. Actually, for three reasons. First, because I think people are more likely to listen to people who are of their tribe, on their side. Second, because it helps me from you know, digging my heels in on this issue. It helps me say, whoa, not everything is right about the thing that I believe. And I, I have to not go too far. I don't want to go down this rabbit hole. But number three, I think people are watching. And when they see constructive conversation with disagreements among people on the same side, I think, well, I harbor this kumbaya hope that maybe, um, that maybe discourse as a whole will improve. Nine is just reach across the aisle. Spend time with people who don't agree with you um, and, and talk, listen, maybe in contexts that, you know, the, the politics or the charged issue doesn't come up. And, you know, when, when my husband and I moved to Cape Cod, we, we started growing food and, and hunting and foraging. And that's actually what my book is about. And I ended up joining groups, the Cape Cod Organic Gardeners, um, the, the fishing club. I took hunter education and I was put in rooms with people that I wouldn't have met otherwise, many of whom thought differently from the way that I thought about things. And it was enriching and it was interesting. And I thought it helped me in my quest um, to not harden my positions to be able to change my mind. So, of course, number 10 is buy my book. Um, and this is what people are saying about it. It is about the good things that happen when, when, when you go outside and get dirty in service of dinner. But it's also got the secret to successful self-improvement. So let's make sure we get that in there. But actually, here are the real, the real reasons. Um, and I put them on a slide so so they're there in in one place. But I'm gonna I'm gonna add one, and that is be kind. And again, there are a couple reasons for this. One is that I don't think it's ever wrong to be kind. Um, but number two, it is a way of preventing your own hardening. Once you call somebody who disagrees with you some kind of name, it's going to be that much harder for you to decide that that person was right all along. And, you know, in all my quest to change my mind, I have changed my mind on a number of issues. And, you know, some of them are pretty arcane. I've changed them on the, the very basics of human nutrition and, and what's good for people. I changed my mind about whether the FDA should should tighten regulations on supplements. I changed my mind about whether uh, uh, programs that double SNAP are a, a good human health intervention. Um, but mostly I found myself slower to take a position. Um, the, the scope of issues that I'm willing to take a position on has narrowed to the ones where I really feel like I have a grasp of the evidence. And on a lot of other things, I find myself listening more um, and maybe not having an opinion at all. And I find that simple kindness helps me not box myself into, into a corner. 
And so the essence of this is that, no, facts don't persuade people. But some days on a good day, people persuade people. And if we want better discourse, think less about being persuasive and think a little more about being persuadable. And thanks for listening. I'm gonna go wow. back and zoom. That so I'm gonna was, stop sharing. That was great. Thank you, Leanne. So great. And I, I, I have many thoughts and we have several questions. But first and foremost, I have to say it sounds like uh, your father and mine were cut from the same cloth. Uh, I, did your I, dad do that? Yes, he did. Uh, from my hilarious. childhood, we would, I, I call it debating, arguing, whatever. I grew up thinking that that was normal and fun. You know, he would we'd pick a topic or he would mention something and we'd just go and talk about it. And then when he got me to see his side, he would switch and we do it again. <laughs> <laughs> like, what? So, yeah, that made dating life very interesting. Boys thought I was being combative. <laughs> So I'm willing to bet, given this audience, I'm willing to bet that you and I are not the only people who have had this mm -hmm. experience or are, are people who are willing to do this. And and like like I said, it's annoying as hell when people take yes. a position just to argue with you. But but it really does help you learn and it really does cement the idea that there are there are two reason or more reasonable sides to yes. to an issue. Yes, I, I would sometimes drive to work with my dad in the mornings, you know, he would drop me off and I get on the train and go to school. And he would listen to this really obnoxious, uh, conservative radio host, no names necessary. And I wouldn't listen, you know, I'd just be in my own world. And finally, one day I started listening. And I'm like, my God, Daddy, why are you listening to this? He goes, you have to know how people other than you are different from you think you have to know what's out there, and what people are saying. And mm -hmm. I was stunned i mean i i think very very highly of my dad he my lost mine uh recently too 2019 i'm sorry but yeah no and i yeah I your dad and my dad died my, the same year oh wow i'm so sorry well i i, I would I, this is not my belief but it is fun to think that they might be somewhere <laughs> no, it's not my belief either but i love the idea <laughs> I love, yes, yes. There's sometimes I indulge in that. And this would be one of those times. So I, I, I thank you for, for sharing that. It made it very, um, a sweet memory for me. Um, it sounds from everything you've been sharing with us, you know, you've given us some good books. It sounds like we are, we are evolutionary toddlers at this. Um, we need to cut ourselves some slack because we are just engaging in this taste great, less filling constant battle um with ourselves and uh you really stabbed me in the heart there when you said uh, not only does science not protect us but neither does education like it does not. what <laughs> but i'm one of the smart ones what are we doing here <laughs> yeah i know and it's really hard because like I, I've always thought that, okay, this should be something I can do. I, I, but no, I'm absolutely persuaded that we are all just bad at this. And if we want to be better, it takes effort. And I took your question seriously and I'm a little embarrassed at uh, how often have I changed my mind? It's hard, isn't Not, it? it? It actually really is. It's very challenging. And, and I thought I was at, I'm on the road to being a better human, I'd like to think. But I did change my mind in 2019. <laughs> oh, yeah. I a life, yes, I was a lifelong dog person and I got a cat and it is one of the best decisions I'd ever made. I am team, I'm team both now. I'm team big love, big fur. Um, so yeah, I, I'm on, I, I switched sides in 2019. And then um, last year, and this is probably the things we do for love. I'm dating a former journalist who is a staunch non-believer in the Oxford comma. <laughs> that, oh, yeah, those are fighting words. Oh, I know. I know. And and we still, you know, lovingly joke about it. But whenever I send him a long text because I am a full sentence texter, I will remove the Oxford comma and then point out that I removed the oh, Oxford comma. That. Just well, for OK, him. <laughs> I was about to say that it was love until you got to the part where you pointed it out. And I'm like, well, well maybe you know, not so much. That's become our thing. It's like I want credit. <laughs> okay, I'll give you credit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The actual common fighting words for sure. Um, but you uh, conjured a uh, Kevin F uh, Folta, if I say it. Kevin Folta, and he said he was gonna uh, yes, be he is, attending. 
he is here. He said, thanks for the shout out. Awesome as always. And uh, he said, I love to talk to the smartest person that uh, disagrees with me. I invite them for pizza. You know, I guess it all goes down with pizza. Um, and I invite them for beer, invite them to public Zoom calls, invite them to be guests on podcasts. The problem is that few take me up on the offer, almost none. What is the best way to get them to the table? Thank you. Well, uh, unfortunately, it's to have a column in the Washington Post. <laughs> and, and, and I mean, I'm joking about that, but I will tell you that one of the best parts of my job is that I get to call people up and ask them to just talk to me about the thing that they study. And it is, it's wonderful. And, uh, and yeah, it's, it's a perk of my job. And by the way, there aren't that many perks of my job. <laughs> <laughs> the pace <laughs> crap, <laughs> but, but, but yeah, I do have that going for me. And I guess, I think, you know, in our circles, we know people who, who uh, disagree with us. Um, and if you can't talk to them in person, seek out their writing and, mm -hmm. and try and read it with an open mind. And it's harder, you know, with a written word than it is in person, because one of the things about uh, this dynamic is that people do persuade people. And it's one of the reasons I'm frustrated to not be talking to people in person because there's something about a personal connection that helps with this. But yeah, look for the stuff uh, written. Yeah. And I, if I could add, um, maybe honestly saying that this is not going to be an ambush or an argument that you truly... Yes want to to make a connection because I think people you know they get their back up they're just ready to fight and then they don't want to fight and then they 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 don't want to do it so mm -hmm. so I don't know if that I, I'm sure that, that that he's done that but I'll throw that out from from my experience um Rona Bazan I'm not sure if I'm saying your name correctly Rona uh said what if the smart people who disagree uh with you express their view in rants so I would suggest that for any position that is worth listening to, there are people who don't rant. And I guess when I say the smartest person who disagrees with you, I, I also want to add smartest reasonable person who, who disagrees <laughs> with you. Okay. And, uh, I, and, and I guess what I'm looking for is to find somebody you can respect who holds a different position from yours. Um, curious, this is from John Thomas, wants to know why do you hunt? Is it for sport or to feed yourself uh, or your family or friends? If, if my family needed me to hunt, uh, we'd be vegetarians, <laughs> honestly. It's only to feed my family. And uh, I'm a meat eater and I, uh, well, John, you should read my book. It explains it all that I think, you know, the most responsible way to eat meat is to take an overpopulated ruminant out of an ecosystem where it's doing damage. And that's a positive good for the ecosystem as well as uh, something that I can feed my family. Look, I don't enjoy it. I don't go out there. I, it, it, I, every time I point a gun at a deer at my heart races, I, but I do it because I do think it is a responsible way to eat meat. And I know that's a whole different conversation and we didn't, that's not the conversation we came here to have, but no, I can have that no, one too. No, but, but thank you, but thank you for answering that. Um, since you showed the picture, I thought it was worth um, uh, sure. exploring that. A anything's um, that fair game. I'll, I'll talk about diet soda if you want. <laughs> oh yeah, that shocked me by the way. And I'm not a soda drinker unless it's, you know, heavily sterilized with, you know, some sort of alcohol. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but yeah, that surprised because that, that seemed to maybe, I, I might've heard that story somewhere. Diet soda is bad for you. And it's sort of stuck in my brain and you, know, you just pass that off at, at parties and you think you're being accurate. And I guess you're not, I'm not. Thank you. <laughs> Matthew has said, regarding your question about changing one's mind, I seldom see cases where evidence changes so dramatically to cause such a change. Is this sort of uh, adhere to your theory that the smarter you are and the more educated you are, the more committed you are to the, the stance that you've taken? I, might... I, I think that, you know, the, the idea that the evidence has to change in order for you to change your mind presupposes that you you change you made your mind up on the evidence in the first place. Mm. 
Ooh. And so, uh, you know, what the reason to change your mind isn't just because the information changes. It's because you find that you parsed it the wrong way the first time and that you did go down your uh, your value slash gut slash intuition slash tribe uh, route and your elephant made this decision and now your rider is overriding your elephant. So the point of trying to change your mind isn't just to find situations where the evidence changes. It's to find situations where you were just flat out wrong. Mm. I like that. That actually makes me think of uh, when you read a book at different points in your life, something that I read and they're different twenties yep. and I read it now. It's the same book. Didn't change. I did. Yep. Mm -hmm. Very similar, but I, I really, really like that. Thank you. That's a great answer. Um, Jan Camo says, what do you think of the argumentative theory on human reasoning? Uh, Mercer Sperber 2011. Can that help understand why we reject facts that contradict our beliefs? I don't know what this theory is. Okay. Just Sorry. That's okay. Um, let me see. Just moving along. Oh, um, Dallas wants to know, do you suggest, uh, oh, did you suggest that you think locally produced food is not good? for climate change, please no, it can isn't. you explain both sides of this argument and why one wins? So I'm going that's to- That's not what I heard, but that's why someone no, heard it that so, way. Local food is not optimal for the environment. And uh, you know, instead of getting into a whole explanation here, I'm going to point you to the episode of Climavores, the podcast that I co-host with my fellow journal journalist Mike Grunwald. Um, and we did an issue, we did an episode, one of the earliest ones. I would it just launched a couple months ago, so I think there's only eight episodes out there. Um, and one of them is on local food, and it goes into it chapter and verse. But the, the main issue is that transportation, which is, of course, what you're saving when you buy locally, is only responsible for single digit, probably under 5% of the greenhouse gas impact of food. And so not having it transported from far away doesn't save you much. And that savings is easily overridden by growing things more efficiently in places where that it's really hospitable to that particular crop. That's the short answer. The long answer is on the, uh, the uh, climate force episode. Thank you. Um, Brian Engler. Hi, Brian. Um, said, thank you. Great talk. Uh, you mentioned changing your opinion on the FDA assessing supplements. What this is, is so funny that everybody wants body? to know about these particular positions. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? <laughs> okay, why did I, how did I change my mind and why did I change my mind? And, um, and, and change to what? Like, what, where right. do you stand I now? I used to believe that the FDA should absolutely be cracking down on supplements because some of it is out and out fraud. Yes. And I had a conversation with the outgoing uh, director of the NIH's Office of Dietary Supplements. And he made the point that, okay, ideally, yes, the FDA should, but the FDA has limited resources. And primarily the people who are harmed by supplements are affluent people, the worried well, and most of the harm is financial. There are some exceptions, but in cases where the supplement is actually dangerous, the FDA has teeth to go after that. So most of the time, the damage is minimal and it's to people who can afford it. And with an agency with limited resources, I would rather have those resources protect people who are vulnerable from serious harm. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Caroline, uh, her question is, people tend to identify their beliefs. Let me, let me take that again. People tend to identify with their beliefs. So changing a belief is a change of identity, which is difficult to do. So yes, how do it we is. Persuade someone to detach their identity from their beliefs. I would rephrase that. How do I, how do I, how do I persuade do it myself? Me? Yeah. See, how and, do I do that just but this me? is a great question. And you know, this happens almost every time. 
I give the talk, it's so easy to pivot from how do I reason better to how do I get them to reason better? Because that's ingrained in us. And of course we want to do that. And here I am telling you to be more persuadable, but here I am trying to persuade you of something. <laughs> I'm trying to be persuasive. I don't mean to go all meta on you, but this is the normal human condition that we go out and we try and persuade people. But yes, yeah, she put her finger on exactly why it's difficult because these things become a part of our identity. And when things become charged like this and just look at our political landscape, look how we think about vaccines, look at how we think about climate change, look at how we think about, you know, mask wearing. Um, and and it, it's so difficult for people to change their minds for exactly that reason. And, you know, this is why, excuse me, this is why I'm so, uh, what's the word? I, I'm so committed to this idea of trying to be persuadable because I think we sort of change one person at a time where we try and soften both in person and on social media. And, you know, nothing is going to change on a dime. You're not, I'm not, the other people we're trying to persuade aren't. This is just, this is a gradual ratcheting back of a, a human cognitive tendency that I think has just gone haywire in our current political climate. And you, you, when you talk about persuadable, I, and I wanna add, and I might be wrong here, but that's not the same as being gullible. People assume sometimes, well, if I'm open, then I'm, I'm gonna get swindled, I'm gonna get taken. And it's an interesting that, point. Yeah, that's, I, I, and I know that's not what you mean. No, um, no, it's not what yeah. I mean. <laughs> but uh, yeah, you're right. You're right. People like, and of course, with with people trying to persuade us of all kinds of crazy things, it makes sense to be a little bit <laughs> careful. And obviously, yes. you have to be on your guard. Right. A bit skeptical, shall we say. <laughs> oh, yes. Shall we say. <laughs> I, and by the way, I do love uh, that your uh, your dad or your parents were subscribers uh, to they Skeptical totally Choir. That that is that is just so awesome. Very full circle here. Yes, very um, full circle. Tim wants to know: uh, Would you elaborate a bit? And uh, we, I know we're coming to the top of the hour, but would you elaborate a bit on what is meant by a food desert? Uh, not everyone. Oh, knows. sure. A food desert is a place where people don't have access to a full-service supermarket or a, a a good assortment of fresh, wholesome foods. And usually, not usually, often they're in uh, inner cities where there's just convenience stores. Sometimes they're in rural areas where supermarkets are far apart. So it's just a, a an area where people don't have access to, to, to good food. Thank you. Um, this is, well, this is a question for me, actually. Arthur said, Leanne, did you not just awesome. violate tomorrow's rule number 10, be kind by calling the conservative radio commentator obnoxious? Um, in all fairness, I was characterizing the uh, college me and, and recounting the conversation I had then um, with my dad, but good catch. <laughs> but I will, I'll add that there is absolutely behavior that is beyond the pale and it's okay oh, yes. to say that um antonio garcia said what's the comma uh, the oxford comma that it's also known <laughs> as a series comma antonio so when you're talking about three things when you say red comma white comma and comma blue it's meant to clarify what you mean in a sentence and things aren't necessarily confused um journalists have learned to take that comma out to save space in print and that doesn't really exist that much so i don't know how much space we're saving everybody. who knew this talk would go to the oxford <laughs> comma oh it, with me it always goes star trek and oxford comma all right and that I'll, brings me so I'll I, I'll someone away. asked this question somewhere and I'll, i'm paraphrasing they wanted to know if your title of your book uh to boldly grow was in any way uh an homage to uh the opening lines of star trek absolutely uh, it's <laughs> absolutely <laughs> it it's a joke Yay. I love it. I love it. Um, and I know we're, we're about to hit that eight o'clock hour. Can I squeeze in one more question? Sure. 
to. Um, Sergio wants to know, do you think that opinions are more polarized now than they yes. were a couple of decades ago? I do. And there are there are people who who actually try and study this rigorously, certainly in the realm of politics. Our politics have gotten more polarized. There's evidence that our political views on both the left and the right in voters have become more polarized. And I think that, you know, the evidence of our, our very eyes um, has, has showed us that they are more polarized. So everything does point to it's being more polarized. And I think it's a very unfortunate situation. Uh, I do too. This is, this is one of those um, episodes of Skeptical Inquirer Presents that I wish we had way more time because um, I, I I I feel like if it, we were, if we were at CSI at the conference, we, you would do your presentation. I'd come back on stage, and then afterwards, I'd I'd, I'd I'd stalk you to the bar, and we'd sit and have a glass of wine and talk more um, about this. And I actually lied. I want to do one more question from Joseph because okay. I think this is good. Um, and you've kind of answered it, but I'd love to end on this note. How would you try to engage those of opposite opinions to express themselves in a civil manner? See, you can't yeah. change your mother. <laughs> I feel like a therapist. You can't get other people to do it. You can only set an example by doing it yourself. Yeah. And I know it feels like you're pissing into the wind because you just, you try and, and are civil and constructive and people come back and say, it, uh, the names I get called on Twitter, I can't even tell you. Oh and so it's, it's, it's frustrating um, and it feels like it's thankless, but I think it's the only way to ratchet this back. I agree. I actually uh, took the advice of this show that I'm on and had one of those very difficult conversations with someone who's a supporter of the former president and I am not. And it was really interesting when he understood that I wasn't attacking him, that I really wanted to have a civil conversation I heard the shift in his voice. Like he's like, really? We're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna talk. <laughs> like, yeah, it happens yeah. <laughs> one conversation at a time. And I, I will say it was exhausting. Like I literally hung up the phone and took to my bed. <laughs> but but it it was worth having. It was worth having. But Tamar, thank you so very, very much uh, for your time and your expertise uh, to boldly grow. Uh, everyone, don't forget uh, her book. And if you've thank missed you. <laughs> any of this presentation, it has been recorded and will be available tomorrow for you to catch up, rewatch, and share at skepticalinquirer.org. And as always, my thanks to Skeptical Inquirer, the Center for Inquiry, uh, tonight's producer, Mike Powell, and of course, to you, the audience, for taking the time to spend with us tonight. Uh, my name is Leanne Lord. Thank you. Good night. Tamar, thanks a lot. This was great. Oh, my husband just walked in with a, a glass of wine. Did you know that it just ended this one, this second? That's perfect, because I'm going to go get my glass. And so uh, Leanne, clink, that was clink, so fun. Cheers. Thank you. You're totally awesome. Oh, we have to have the glass of so wine you. if we're in the same place. Yeah, at least, at least. But good night, everybody. Thank you. Good night, hon. <laughs>